So welcome everyone um, to our speaker series, uh, Preparing for a Day of Truth and Reconciliation. I wanna first acknowledge that we are in Mi'kmaq, uh, the ancestral and unceded territory of my ancestors, the Mi'kmaq. I'm thankful for the land to offer me a place to live, play, learn, and connect with all of you. My name is Hannah Asprey, and I'm the programs manager for the Indigenous Health and Medicine program here at Dalhousie University. With 2021 being the first year we celebrate a day of truth and reconciliation on September 30th, the Indigenous Health and Medicine program is excited to have you join us this week as we walk through the truths and how we can work towards reconciliation and putting our actions into practice in healthcare. Just a few housekeeping tips uh, before we get started. If you could please keep your mics muted and your cameras off uh, just until the question answer portion at the end of the session. Uh, and we're gonna start off our series uh, this evening with a few words from the Dean of Medicine uh, at Dalhousie University, Dr. David Anderson. So David, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah, and welcome everyone. Uh, and, and thank you for joining us this evening and, and hopefully for the next three days this Truth and Reconciliation rec uh, uh, speaker series. Um, I, I also would like to recognize that Dalhousie University is, re is Seated in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, we are all people. I, I'm very pleased to welcome you here this evening to this inaugural Indigenous Health and Medicine Preparing for a Day of Truth and Reconciliation speaker series. I'm, I'm happy to be with you and, and thankful for our distinguished guest speakers who have donated their time to participate in this discussion of great importance. On September 30th, Dalhousie Medical School will join the Dalhousie community and indeed the rest of the country in observing the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation as a day of remembrance and reflection and to honor survivors of residential schools, their families and communities. Dalhousie's observance of this day aligns with our commitment to using the medical school's platform and resources to making the Faculty of Medicine a catalyst for change and an inclusive and welcoming place for all to learn. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's call to action remind us that we need to do our part in redressing the colonial history of residential schools and attempts to disseminate the identity, education, and life chances of Indigenous peoples. Acknowledging that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, is just the beginning. As an older white male, I recognize that I am someone who has grown up in privilege. I am not an expert in social injustice or colonialism, but I'm committed to learning. As a physician, dean, and leader, I recognize that the Faculty of Medicine must increase its efforts to make us a more inclusive and welcoming place for all to work and learn. We recognize that the lack of doctors from Indigenous communities is a systemic problem with health consequences, and the continued underrepresentation of certain groups creates physician shortages in these communities. We are making efforts to respond to the health needs of diverse communities in our region. And this includes further strengthening and expanding our current academic programs, increasing the efforts of recruitment and retention of Indigenous students, staff and faculty, and strengthening partnerships with Indigenous community. And we know there is much more that needs to be done. What we, the Faculty of Medicine, are doing to be leaders in system change and how we're serving our communities will make us better educators, scientists, and physicians who will stand against intolerance, prejudice, and racism. I would also like to acknowledge both Ms. Hannah Asprey and Dr. Brent Young for the incredible work and efforts that they have done in pulling this seminar series together on short notice. Hannah is the faculty's Indigenous Health and Medicine Program Manager and is responsible for providing support to students, community, and faculty members. Since 2016, the Indigenous Health and Medicine Program has sought to increase representation of Indigenous students in medicine through recruitment, community collaboration, and partnerships. As well, the program aims to address the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and further Dalhousie's commitment to social accountability to the maritime Indigenous population. 
It advises me and my role of Dean to fulfill our social accountability mandate to the Maritime Provinces Indigenous community. Dr. Brent Young graduated from Dalhousie Medical School in 2019 and has recently joined Dalhousie's Faculty of Medicine and Department of Family Medicine in a new role as Academic Director of Indigenous Health. Through this work, he will lead the Faculty of Medicine on matters pertaining to Indigenous health under the guiding principles of the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Anna and Brent, thank you. These events would not be possible without you. Yes. I hope all students, faculty and staff will take time, take time history, culture and lived experience of Indigenous peoples. I encourage you to t attend each of the three series hosted by the Faculty of Medicine and our Indigenous Health and Medicine program and use September 30th as a day for listening, learning and committing to the important work required of us as we live up to our treaty obligations. Let us better encourage and support Indigenous members of our Dalhousie community and think about the society that was and the society that we want to be and we will collectively work for a more respectful, inclusive campus community and society. Thanks again for being with us tonight and be well. Not only is this a shared opportunity, it's a shared responsibility and we are all in this together. Thanks very much for this opportunity to speak to this, this group before this very important uh, lecture series. Thank you very much, Hannah. Thanks so much, Dr. Anderson. Um, now we're going to hear uh, from Director of Community Engagement, uh, Catherine Martin uh, from Dalhousie University to give us a welcome and an opening prayer. There. Ah, metawalok Tanas. <laughs> okay, good. At least I know you're there. <laughs> oh, we have a few of you out there, I see. Very nice. I see Dr. Carl Marshall with the eyebrows raising. Mercedes. Hey. Well, hey, got a gill. So, we yeah. <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't talk behind everybody's back, so... I said um, hello to all of you and Neen Gadalan and Maltai. My name is Catherine Martin and I am the Indigenous Community Engagement Director, not the whole thing for the university because that would be too hard for me. <laughs> I've just lit some smudge, um, some sweet grass or sweet hay, which is the hair of Mother Earth and it's one of our four sacred medicines and sage in my abalone. Oh, see, it disappears in this virtual background. So I'm lighting it for all of us, and I want to um, dedicate my opening um, and my prayers to the um, beautiful little souls who have come forward to shake us up a bit and, and guide us to finding all of the children that want to come home. And I really believe it's those children that, that are the ones that are, are dancing and joyfully finding ways to get us to find them, just like a little hide and seek. And I want to honor them. Um, also, I suspect that Hannah would have, or if she hasn't, or Brent, you could put up some kind of information if anybody is triggered or needs to be um, called. I mean, you have most of those people here. <laughs> so, you know, but if you if any of you need help, um, I will be here as well. So you're welcome to, you know, chat with me. Um, but uh, in keeping with the tradition of our, our ancestors, a little blue jay just drove, just popped in, so whatever that is. So um, it's, it's traditional, it always has been for 14,000 years and it always will be 
our way, the Mi'kmaq way, to welcome everybody to our territory, to our land that we've taken care of for all this time, and that we invite you like we have with all peoples for 14,000 years to come and share our land. And I also want to ask that we begin to walk on her, on Mother Earth, and in, in the cycle of Grandmother Moon, that we begin to walk in the way that was intended here in Mi'kma'ki, to the beat of the heartbeat of Mother Earth and to the cycle of the moon. And that's one way to begin with how we begin to become um, the messengers of truth and reconciliation in the right way. Eskasoni elder and beautiful teacher uh, Sarah Denny, our a late Sarah Denny from Eskasoni, taught this to me. And I look around and I suspect that a lot of your parents were taught this song from Sarah, but from others lately. And she always said to sing this when we gather with other nations, when we gather with ourselves, when we celebrate life, when we celebrate death, when we celebrate. And uh, so this is the chant that she taught to me. <clears throat> I'd like to um, welcome you all to this evening's incredible talk, Every Talk from the Heart, which is the way we are to talk in Mi'kma'ki, from your heart. So when you talk from your heart, you're speaking the first language that all of us in the world were taught, and that is the language of our mother the language of the heartbeat. And when we speak that language, no matter what else you speak after, we can all understand the language of the heart. And also, because it's the language of our mother, it's the truth. 
It's the language of truth. So um, just in case Denas is nervous or Dr. Marshall or any of our speakers, just get back into the rhythm of your mom's language and your heartbeat and you'll have no problem with anything you want to do in the world. And thanks Hannah and Brent for inviting me and um, I'm really proud of all of you, all of you. And, I, and I'm just so excited to see so many of you taking the positions that you deserve to take. Walaliok. I'm sitting Ogama. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, such a warm welcome as always. Uh, we love having you attend our events. So now I'd like to introduce to you um, our first speaker, uh, Danas Silvoy. He is a Mi'kmaq nurse practitioner from Escazoni First Nations, currently working in Millbrook First Nations. His educational background includes a Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree obtained from Cape Breton University and a Master's of Nursing degree from Dalhousie University. He's also currently working with the Aboriginal Children Healing and Hurt Initiative at the IWK. His interests include patient advocacy, anti-racism, pediatric pain research, chronic disease management, youth health, mental health, and utilizing Mi'kmaq language in care. So Danas, we're so happy to have you here and speak with us tonight and everyone's looking forward to hear from you. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. And we're so lucky that he's working in Millbrook. <laughs> well, Leo, thank you. Uh, let me just pull up my presentation. Um, I, th I think it came up probably. Um, First Nation, Millbrook First Nation. Um, so I'm saying my name is Athanasius and Mi'kmaq. Uh, I'm saying that I am a nurse practitioner currently working in Millbrook First Nation, and I am from Eskasoni First Nation in Onamagi. Um, today's topic, we're going to talk about Gedlo, uh, which is truth. And I was kind of like, I kind of got like chills when Kathy was saying, um, speaking from the heart, because a lot of uh, what I'm going to talk about is speaking from the heart. And um, uh, there's a phrase that we say, it comes from the heart. And I really do feel that's what truth is. It comes from the heart. You're speaking from your heart and you speak with your heart. And, and, and that's truth. Um, and you can't do no wrong as long as you're speaking the truth and you're listening to truth. Um, so a uh, little trigger warning, uh, I am going to uh, go over racism, uh, intergenerational trauma and residential schools. Uh, this this presentation uh, is more of a, a, a kind of a narrative kind of journey, if anything. Uh, so for a lot of indigenous uh, people, this may be triggering and for non-indigenous people too, uh, as this could uh, go over some memories of un uh, culturally unsafe uh, personal experiences or such experiences of their uh, friends, family and communities that they have may have experienced uh, within the healthcare system. Uh, I do always kind of try to uh, acknowledge um, a land acknowledgement that uh, we've kind of went through. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that where we currently work and live is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of my people, and that we are all treaty people, and that these lands are, are covered by the, the peace and friendship treaty signed between the Mi'kmaq and, and the, the British in 1752. Uh, I do want to start off my presentation, uh, and I really do feel that this sets the tone um, for this topic and its truth, and we're trying to move towards reconciliation. And But in order to move towards reconciliation, uh, we need to kind of go through the, the journey uh, that Indigenous people have faced through many generations. And uh, one of the, the poems by the late Rita Joe, the Mi'kmaq laureate, uh, wrote a poem about her experience in residential school and I always kind of want to acknowledge because um, there's a lot of history in, in this poem uh, when it comes to loss of language and, and refinding ourselves and trying to teach us of teach you of us 
Um, so I lost my talk. The talk he took away when I was a little girl at Shibunakadi School. You snatched it away. I speak like you. I think like you. I create like you. The scrambled ballad about my word, two ways I talk, both ways I say. Your way is more powerful. So gently I offer my hand and ask, so let me find my talk so I can teach you about me. Um, and I always just like want to pause and just to kind of remember um, generations that we have lost and generations that are still here, um, that are still practiced in our language, our culture and our traditions, despite years of colonization and assimilation and attempts to, to, to end uh, indigenous people. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about the turtle. Uh, this is a Mikjitsk. Um, and the Mikjitsk, um, the turtle, represents uh, one of the seven sacred teachings on how we can live a balanced life. Uh, the truth carries, the, the turtle carries truth. Truth is symbolic of law and principle. Since in the beginning of time, the turtle has not changed um, for, from prehistoric era, Jurassic era, it pr pretty much appears the same. <laughs> And the turtle has been chosen to be the bearer of truth and the basic truth of the laws and of, of nature. Uh, and the, these are things that have not changed through the years. Uh, the turtle has been able to adapt to change, no, been able to adapt to change without changing itself. Um, thus, he represents truth. He also represents time, as his shell has 13 big plates in the center, symbolizing the 13 moons in one year. Uh, as, as we go over this presentation, we'll reflect on truth, the truth of history, the truth of the present, and the truth of the future. Uh, it is not to name and shame. We look to build the collective strength necessary to advance as a whole and as a society. Uh, the Mi'kmaq term, uh, means helping one another. And, and this is something that we all should be working towards, is helping one another. Uh, the truths that we uncover will help us reflect and remind ourselves what it is to be an what it is to be Ulnug, the people. All of us learn from our failures and successes, and this is us uh, um, needed to confront the un uncomfortable histories and negative systemic practices that surround us, so we can all start our healing journeys collectively. Um, so, just kind of brief history: um, the term indigenous is an inclusive term referring to First Nations, Innu, and Métis people. Each of these groups has unique histories, cultural traditions, and languages and beliefs. Um, I just hear some feedback. Are you guys hearing me okay too? <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, so this term is internationally recognized and is our preferred terminology. And, and for Mi'kmaq, First Nations also prefer to, or Mi'kmaq. Indigenous children are the fastest growing cohort in Canada, and yet they have the most profound health conditions interfering with their optimal health, de healthy development. Uh, Canada, Canada's history with Indigenous people is marred with forced assimilation efforts, colonization, and countless forms of abuse. Mi'kmaq, or the Ulnug as we refer to ourselves, are our First Nation people traditionally occupying the Atlantic provinces, and we extend to parts of Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec and parts of Maine. Here in Nova Scotia, um, we have many Mi'kmaq communities, um, five of which are in Onamagi uh, that re represent the Union of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq, and there are eight Mi'kmaq communities represented by the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, and there are many more communities. Um, so the population of Mi'kmaq is expected to be over 170,000 throughout the world. In Nova Scotia, we have roughly 25,000 identified, um, and only 4 to 5 percent uh, actually consider themselves fluent in Onuism, the, the Mi'kmaq language. Uh, so that's just a little bit brief history on, on the Mi'kmaq. Uh, so, I am going to go over some highlights on why we're gathered here today and why we're talking about um, um, why every child matters and, and no child should be left behind. Um, on September 30th, you may have noticed a lot of people are going to be wearing orange. Uh, I, I do want to share a quick story of Phyllis, Phyllis uh, Webstead. 
Uh, she's Nordish, Northern Sheshwap. Um, when Phyllis was a little girl, she was excited to go to residential school for the first time. Her granny bought her a bright orange shirt that she loved and she wore to school for her first day. When she arrived at school, her bright orange shirt was taken away. This is both Phyllis's Webstad's true story and the story behind the Orange Shirt Day, which is a day for all Canadians to reflect on the tr treatment of First Nations people and that the message that every child matters. Um, so this is a picture of the Shubanakne uh, Indian Residential School, which is roughly 35 kilometers away from, or historically 35 kilometers away from where I'm presenting today in Millbrook. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that it's no longer present, but the site is still present. Uh, and the message that that it continues to live on uh, still lasts in our communities. All Indigenous people living in Canada were exposed to either the reality or the threat of residential schools between the 1880s and uh, the last one closing in 1996. These network of boarding schools were created and funded by the Canadian government and was operated by Christian churches. The goals of these schools was to isolate children from their homes and families, stripping them of their culture, language and identity with their sole purpose of killing the Indian and the child. While in, in these schools, children were subjected to abu abuse in all shapes and forms, physical, sexual, mental and spiritual. As I mentioned, this photo here is of the Shubanakadi Indian Residential School, which operated between 1930 and 1967. Over a thousand children are estimated to have been placed in this institution over 37 years. And these children that did make it home have gone on to be parents, grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents, aunts and uncles. Um, and the effects of intergenerational, the effects of residential schools still lives on in our communities. Um, so that said, over the 100 year period that the IRS was open, over 150,000 up towards 170,000 uh, children were placed, were forcefully removed from their homes. Uh, some were placed in positions that if they didn't go to these schools, that they would be forcefully removed from their families anyway, or their families could be jailed. These schools disrupted the lives of communities uh, and lives, uh, causing long-term disruption and intergenerational hurt experienced by Indigenous peoples all over Canada due to the continuous loss of our culture, language and identities. And as Kathy mentioned, uh, the beautiful children that have been found over the last year uh, have accounted greater than 6,509. And this is still, I would imagine this num number has changed. It's changing daily. And it's a, it's a constant reminder that that at some point in time, we, we were made to be less. At some point in time, we were murdered in these schools, we were abused in these schools, we were with hold of love, compassion, and dignity. Uh, we were subjected to, like I said, abuse in every shape and form. Um, and I, I just kind of want to commemorate and remember those children that didn't make it home. I want to commemorate and remember those children who lost their language. And I commemorate those who we found their language, their identity and culture and still lives on through generations. As you can see here, this is a, a map of uh, the residential schools across Canada. And as you can see, uh, the Shubanakadi Residential School Service, the Atlantic provinces, um, and as I mentioned, over a thousand children uh, from our communities were displaced in the school. All right, so we're gonna talk. So as we went through the truth of uh, history, um, we're, we'll talk about the truth of the present and why it's important uh, to, to move towards reconciliation. Uh, this road is quite complicated and we are still far off from our destination. But it, it, once we get there, we will all benefit. Um, not just Indigenous people, but also non-Indigenous people. This has been complicated by colonization, assimilation, residential schools, centralization, uh, um, cultural genocide amongst murdered and mi missing Indigenous women in two-spirit, Indian day schools, and the 60s scoop. 
So just kind of reflecting what does reconciliation mean? I will go through a few definitions. Uh, reconciliation is about atonement. Uh, oh, this is a quote from Senator Murray Sinclair, who was a part of the Truth and uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada uh, report. Reconciliation is about atonement. It's about making amends. It's about apology. It's about recognizing responsibility. It's about accounting for what has gone on, but ultimately it's about commitment to maintaining a mutually respective relationship. Throughout recognizing that even when you establish it, there will be challenges to it. Another definition defines it as a mutually conciliatory accommodation between an antagonistic or formerly antagonistic persons or groups, and easing political tensions between opponents by ironing out the truth of past events. And I want to kind of highlight that we're ironing out the truth of past events in this presentation and continuously through conversations with communities and in healthcare. Uh, another definition by Jane Philpott that reconciliation is a long road. The path behind is marred by the denial of the inherent and treaty rights of Indigenous people. The path ahead begins with the recognition of these rights. Recognition of these rights is not only the foundation for better health outcomes, it is the prerequisite to the survival, dignity, and well-being of Indigenous people. Why is reconciliation important? Well, the forced removal of First Nation Innu and Métis children from their families to residential schools over the span of 120 years really presents a complex and challenging legacy for all Canadians. Uh, not only the impacts of uh, impact results from residential school, but also the appropriation of Indigenous lands, forced community relocation, and replacement of Indigenous governments and outlaw of spiritual practices have contributed to cultural genocide. Some things that we as uh, people in healthcare like are statistics. Um, in North America, Indigenous communities suffer from both physical and mental health risk and diagnosis at higher rates than non-Indigenous people. First Nations have the highest rates of obesity, diabetes, smoking compared to non-Aboriginal populations, all of which contribute to factors for increased mortality rates um, and other health conditions. Uh, the suicide rates uh, amongst Indigenous youth are five to six times more than uh, non-Indigenous uh, youth. Uh, and in, in Nova Scotia, First Nation men are seven times more likely to die from suicide than non-Indigenous Nova Scotians. So, Reconciliation is also important because Indigenous people have survived over 150 years of colonization, 150 years of cultural genocide, 150 years of assimilation, many years of stolen water, many years of stolen language, but also 150 years of survival. The individual and individual family and community level Indigenous people have been managing racism and its impact on health and well-being for hundreds of years, demonstrating resilience in the face of violence, cultural genocide, legis legislative segregation, and appropriation of lands, social and economic, economic oppression. So saying this topic, I am going to review racism, uh, especially what it looks like in healthcare. In September 2008, Brian Sinclair presented to a, to a family practice office uh, because of a block catheter. Uh, he was provided a letter and was told to present to the emergency department in Winnipeg. And so Brian Sinclair presented and checked into a triage desk and then wheeled himself back into the waiting room. Over the next 34 hours, Brian Sinclair sat in his wheelchair without any medical intention. And when finally staff were prompted by people waiting to check in on him, he was already succumbed to sepsis. It later emerged that staff assumed that he was homeless, intoxicated, or that he was already seen. Ryan Sinclair died as the result of racism in healthcare. Uh, Jordan River Anderson, um, who died February 2, 2005, uh, Jordan, Jordan River Anderson is Norway House Cree Nation, from Norway House Cree Nation in Manitoba, was born in 99 with multiple disabilities and stayed in hospital from birth. When he was two years old, doctors said he could move home as long as he had um, a special equipment to meet his medical needs. However, the federal and provincial governments could not agree on who should pay for his home-based care needs. Jordan stayed in hospital until he passed away at the age of five never being able to take, be taken care of at home from his family. 
This is just to highlight how the system continues to fail First Nation, Innu and Métis people. The system continues to fail Black and other racialized communities. September 28, 2020. So going back to Brian Sinclair, during that time, there was calls for action from multiple politicians saying that this is an atrocity that should not have, occur have occurred and will never happen again. Yet almost 12 years later, it brings us to the case of Joyce Eshaquan, a 37-year-old Atikamekw woman admitted to hospital uh, for stomach pains. During this time, she was, she was subjected to uh, abuse in multiple forms, including verbal, mental, and spiritual. She was ridiculed and stereotyped just for being Indigenous. She was deprived of love, compassion, and dignity from the very profession that's here to heal us. Once again, I, I, I want to just key in on the system continues to fail us. This is why this conversation is, in, conversation is important, because we are continuing to suffer. We are continuing to, to die at the result of racism. We are continuing to die at the result of stereotyping and racial bias that exists in medicine and nursing. And if you, don't, if you think it's not as bad in, in the Atlantic provinces, I... I, I would argue that. Um, in New Brunswick, uh, a post was placed in a, a waiting room that attention native patients, please do not ask for tranquilizers or pain medications. What kind of message does that send indigenous patients? It sends to me that I am not worthy for pain control, regardless if I live with addictions or not. We are all worthy of, of having our pain addressed. We are all worthy of having our pain uh, um, believed. Another example we, we highlight over our pandemic, um, we had our first Mi'kmaq vaccine clinic open up in Millbrook. And the sheer racism that the communities face that that why is it that Mi'kmaq people have a first right to this vaccine that that you, you look at the statistics of accessibility to healthcare. You look at the sheer numbers of mortality rates in First Nation communities. You look at overcrowding. You look at inadequate housing. You look at uh, inadequate access to clean drinking water. No one thinks of these things, but it's so easy to say, why is it that they get special preference? And these are stereotypes that continue to exist in our society, not only in healthcare. Um, and then when it comes to practicing what is well within our treaty rights, our communities experience blatant racism, discrimination, and threats for our lives, uh, for what is, like I said, what is well within our treaty rights. We continue to experience the criminalization of what's within our treaty rights for practicing what is moderate livelihood. These are just sheer examples of ongoing racism our communities continue to face. And I know from firsthand, just working in our, our communities during these times, not only we're feeling isolation from COVID-19, but also we're, fair, we're, we're anxious and depressed from everything that we're experiencing from the 6,509 children being found, the racism when it comes to moderate livelihood, the, the sheer racism that, that continues to exist in our system when it comes to access and accessibility. Um, so uh, I do want to talk about dismantling racism in healthcare shouldn't just be done by the very people who experience it. In order to achieve a better tomorrow, we all need to participate. But it seems like what is expected is that racialized communities that endure are expected to do all the work. Communities, both Indigenous and Black and other racialized communities, have been hurting for many centuries by the very institution that was built to heal. Why is it that we continue to be not worthy of love, compassion, respect, and dignity while in hospital or access and emergency care? We have learned and now speak your language. We earn and hold the same money. We drive the same cars. We live in the same houses. We shop in the same stores, but yet we continue to be treated like we are less get to we continue to be treated like we are less than human nursing and medicine uh i'm just going to state it needs more color needs more diversity individuals from all walks of life we can all benefit from utilizing multiple ways of knowing and multiple perspectives 
Our hospitals and health and faculty boards represent the world we walk around in on a day to day basis. We should be able to see ourselves in our profession. We should be able to see ourselves to a point we feel welcome, we feel safe, we feel respected, and that we are going to be provided with dignity. So this report here is the in plain sight document. Uh, it's a comprehensive report that was done in British Columbia. I, I know British Columbia is on the other side of, of Canada, but there are similar experiences in this report that hearing from my communities that we also endure too. We don't, we don't, we, in the Atlantic provinces, from what I know, there is no prolific report on how we assess racism at, as of yet. There is a document from an SHJ, but there's no voices from the communities. Hello? <laughs> Sorry. Um, that threw me off. Sorry. Um, so some themes that were done in this document, they did uh, survey Indigenous people and people who work in, in healthcare, some of which Indigenous, that there's widespread and ongoing stereotyping and racism, which leads to discrimination at the point of care. Some common themes is, and stereotypes that exist, it's always assumed that we are drunk or asked about substance abuse. We're always treated as though we are dishonest always treated as though as we have as if we were bad parents we are never treated as if cultural traditions are appreciated we are never included in care decisions we don't feel safe interacting with various roles within the hospital from nurses social work physicians or NPs we never feel safe to speak up for ourselves when treated uh, mis mistreated um, they're more not likely to make a complaint and, and another common team thing was pain not being taken seriously. Um, some common stereotypes uh, that exist are is we are less worthy of care. Uh, some patients talk about their experiences, um, leaving them with a feeling that they need to prove themselves in healthcare, that they need to prove themselves to healthcare workers that we are worthy of care. This including feeling the need to ensure that they are well dressed before they att attend the emergency department or feel like they have to bring a non-Indigenous person with them in order to be treated properly by medical staff. Um, it's pretty unfortunate that uh, what exists in our healthcare system is um, we have individuals who would rather exhaust all options than to present to an emergency department. And, and research shows that racism against Indigenous people in healthcare is so pervasive that people strategize around anticipated racism before even mis visiting the ER, or in some cases, avoid care altogether. And I'm sure my colleagues uh, in Eskasoni can really speak to that. We 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 often um, try to get our our our, our community members um, to to kind of tell them that you you probably should go to the ER uh, based on what you're experiencing, and a lot of people refuse because what they may or may not experience, or what they have experienced in the past, or what their family uh, members experienced in the past, and each time that you're you're sick or each time the thought of you going to ER your body goes through these motions that not only you have to go from a pre-contemplative phase then a contemplative phase and you go to that action of actually presenting to ER a lot of times people are presenting way too far in their disease course or, or way too late in their disease course um, often finding cancers uh, at later stages or having infections at, at, at target organ sorry multi-organ damage um, if we didn't have this existing we wouldn't even have that thought go through our head that will I or will I not experience racism today Racist stereotypes of Indigenous people spring from the existing roots of colonial attitudes and beliefs that underpin the healthcare system and cause harm and suffering to Indigenous peoples. All forms of racism experienced by Indigenous people lead to avoidance of care, in large part because Indigenous people seek to avoid being stereotyped, profiled, belittled, exposed to prejudice. Racist commentary and behavior towards Indigenous patients is tolerated in the healthcare environments Neither Indigenous patients nor healthcare workers have safe pathways for disclosure and resolution. 
and then I'll kind of try to speak to that part two on a personal level. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I, I've worked in emergency care for many years and I still do. Um, so in the conversation of truth in the future, um, I, I talk about reconciliation. Uh, reconciliation is very important, but the action component to it is is detrimental for for, for the, the the change that needs to be done. Um, and I really do feel that we need to take um, move from a spectatorship to a participation role that we can actually dismantle white supremacy. We can dismantle um, systemic racism. So some things that that are emerging and, and promising is the call for recruitment and retention of indigenous uh, folk in healthcare, um, and then utilize an indigenous directed health and health related services, um, having patient navigators within our healthcare system to ensure that our communities do not fall between the cracks to ensure that we are partaking in culturally safe training that is pertinent to the surrounding communities. Uh, it, it's not really feasible to, to not talk about Mi'kmaq people, especially if you're working in Nova Scotia. It is actually feasible. You should be talking about Mi'kmaq patients. Uh, I wouldn't really expect you to be to have this pan-Indigenous understanding, but you should know the history of Mi'kmaq. You should know the history of the Wunlug and, and just highlighting some of the things that I went through this presentation. Um, the mo move towards trauma-informed care for all um, healthcare providers should include the impacts of historic, collective, and inter intergenerational trauma. We should not hide one of the biggest traumas that has happened to Indigenous people in Canada. Um, one of those documents that I mentioned earlier, I do recommend just going over them. There's 94 calls to actions, um, and this is to redress the legacy of residential schools and to advance reconciliation, and individuals, systems, and communities have a role to meet these calls, not just to benefit Indigenous people, but to also uh, benefit non-Indigenous people too. Um, I talk about uh, Indigenous Ally Toolkit. Uh, this is a great resource if, if you ever want the conversation of how do I become an ally to Indigenous communities. Um, the realization that we don't need white saviorship, we don't need people saving us. We need allies, we need people to stand with us. We don't need people to be our voice or a strong voice for Indigenous people at that. We need people to uplift our voices. We have our own voices. We just need to be put on the platform so people will listen and to make meaningful change. There's a highlight there to start learning, to start learning uh, the lands that you occupy, the languages that are spoken in on these lands, and, and educate yourself uh, the history of the people on the lands you occupy. Uh, being an ally is about disrupting oppressive spaces by educating others and ourselves on the realities and history of, of oppressed people, of racialized people. Um, in closing, uh, I do want to share this quote from Shirley Williams, Dr. Shirley Williams, who is a res residential school survivor. We want to take back our education and teach our history, our language and our culture. We have begun to tell our story, our history, and we want to tell it in our own words to the world so that this will never happen to any other nation in the world. And now I'm repeating the ending of Rita Jo's poem, I Lost My Talk. So I gently offer my hand and ask, let me find my talk so I can teach you about me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Danas. No problem. <laughs> Everyone is so grateful to have you here tonight and to, to hear from your own lived experiences uh, and to share with everyone. So we really appreciate that. Um, and you're going to be able to stick around for some questions and answers at the end. Yeah, I, I meant to share the experiences, but I was like, I'll kind of wait till the end uh, during the Q&A. OK, thank you so much. Yeah, long, thanks. Uh, so next up, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Carl Marshall. 
He was born and raised in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, and he is of Mi'kmaq First Nation background. His mother is from the Whitney Pier and his father from Pulitech First Nations, who who uh, is the long or he is the long uh, standing chief there. He considers both of these communities to be his hometown. He completed his undergraduate bachelor degree of science majoring in biology at Cape Breton University in 2015 and completed his doctorate of medicine at McMaster University in 2018. In uh, 2020, he completed his residency for family medicine at Memorial University in Newfoundland, and he's now practicing full time as a family medicine doctor in Eskazoni First Nation. Eskazoni First Nation is the largest Mi'kmaq community in Nova Scotia, and he's just completed his first year of family practice there. He's very happy to finally be working and giving back to one of our Indigenous communities, as this has been one of his lifelong goals to do. We're so thankful to have you here, uh, Dr. Marshall, and I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to continue this evening. Thank you very much. You can hear me clear? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for that <laughs> introduction. Uh, I'm really glad to, you know, to be here and have the chance and opportunity to, to speak to you all in truth today. Um, I would really like to thank Danas too for, for his speech there. Um, uh, I was actually very fortunate in my first year of practice uh, in Eskazoni. Uh, I was able to work hand in hand with Danas for a good period of time. Um, he's a, a great guy and I'm, I was very excited to hear that he was also speaking here today with me. Um, you can imagine the journey through <laughs> medical school and everything was quite long to so to finally be working like hand in hand with somebody that I could that I had so much in common with <laughs> was a great experience for me. Uh, so thanks again to us for, for doing that. I appreciate it. Um, to expand a little bit on my background there, you know what? I'm a proud <laughs> father of two children. Um, I'm at home right now and they they are supposed to be sleeping, but haven't done a lot of VC stuff <laughs> during this COVID. Uh, Sometimes, uh, you know, they can <laughs> pop up in unplanned ways. So if you hear any crying or anything, like that, just please bear with me there. I, I do have a large family, lots of brothers, lots of sisters, uh, lots of people <laughs> around. Um, you know, I, I do think I, I do have a unique perspective in that, you know, I'm, I've actually mixed heritage background. I'm open about that. Uh, my father, Wilbur Marshall, is, you know, a chief of our community, and I'm very proud of him and all the work he does for us. Um, my mother is white, she's from Sydney, she's a, a teaching assistant. She works at uh, the high school I graduated from. Um, I do feel this background gives me maybe an outlook that may not be quite the same as necessarily anyone else, but it's unique. And I, I think using that and sharing my experiences as a healer in our communities um, will give you like a perspective that maybe you're not as accustomed to singing. Now, like the other, you know, presenters not before me, you know, I, I do like to offer a trigger warning. Some of the things I'll speak about um, can be very triggering and, and deeply, you know, it's certainly for me, uh, you know, bringing these up and, and talking about them. Um, so if in any way there's any issue, just, I mean, the good thing about VC is that, you, you know, you can get up, you can walk away, you can go grab a drink, you know, and collect yourself. So please do so if you feel the need, okay? Um, I may have some overlap with the Danas and some of mine, talk, but I do feel we have a bit of, there's less overlap than I thought there would be, which I, I guess speaks volumes in itself. Um, but uh, sort of to get things started, um, <laughs> the other big thing, I didn't make a PowerPoint presentation. That was specifically for a reason that when I completed medical school, um, I vowed to never do another PowerPoint presentation again. So I'm going to be speaking to you from the heart today uh, about my own personal experiences and everything. If it's hard to follow or you need to re repeat myself, if there's some connectivity issue, just please just buzz in and let me know, and, and I'll be glad to do so. Um, now, about hmm, maybe just a few days ago, I, I overheard a conversation between older ladies at, at uh, Tim Hortons. Something more along the lines of, you know, what's this new native holiday they got going on? Uh, you know, I, I'm sure there's lots of bad stuff. And, you know, I grew up in a poor neighborhood and my friends were really, you know, doing bad. Why don't we get a day? And I, I'd like to, you know, to, to signpost this and, and really talk about this. You know, truth and reconciliation is not about putting down or discarding the hardships of other groups of people. It's not about one-upping them. It's not about shaming or anything like that. It's about acknowledging the true atrocities that occurred to our people here in this land where, where we live today. 
and, and that continue to happen um, along the way. And I think, you know, having this holiday and, and, you know, stamping it, you know, into our Canadian way of life, it opens the door for, for learning more about the truth and, and educating the wider public on what goes on to our people throughout this country. Now, I can't really discuss, you know, the whole day without discussing the, the, the truth and reconciliation uh, calls to action. This was published back in 2015. It, it was sort of a few years in the making, and it was really born, I think, a lot from a lot of the residential school settlements that were happening at that time. Um, it is a document. It's available on the Internet for anyone to read. I do recommend, if you're not familiar with it or you're, you're first hearing about it, to, to read it. But it really... It's just a document full of what I would consider to be very reasonable requests, requests that we would all like, right? So things such as like equal, equal opportunity and access to things like health, child welfare, health care, education, language and culture, justice, um, anything that I would want for, for any individual, not, not just myself, not just my family, for anyone, you know, equal, just being treated the same. Um, one of the requests that were in this document that, you know, I think in theory is a simple request, but I guess not so much. And and that was the request for a, a formal apology from the Catholic Church, uh, from the Pope on behalf of their involvement in the residential uh, schools here in Canada. This was formally issued, I mean, in writing it back in 2015, but I mean, people have been asking for it for years prior to that. And, and today, there has still been no formal apology from the Catholic Church on their involvement. All other major religious groups, Protestant and other groups, have. They've met with their people, they've apologized, but for whatever reason, this one organization just doesn't seem to be necessary to do so. Um, this, to me, speaks volumes to how, you know, the general you know, population, my people feel that they're, you know, they're they've been treated, how their past hardships have been treated, that people just you know, don't want to acknowledge it, they don't want to bring it up. Um, so I think part of this day will be acknowledging those truths, get it up in the forefront, make sure everyone knows. Now, I would like to talk to you a little bit more general on truth and then sort of narrow it down to my own personal experiences and my, you know, my experiences in the healthcare. Um, you know, as a doctor, uh, and please, in any of the questions up ahead, just call me Carl. I hate being called <laughs> Dr. Carl Marshall. Um, but, you know, as a, as a physician, when I go to help people, right, one of the first things that I need to do is recognize what the problem is, right? I need to know, is it the diabetes? Is it the blood pressure? Is it the mental health? I have to acknowledge what it is, what, what that truth is. So once I know that truth, that opens the door to solutions. It allows me to then go down that pathway uh, to find out how best to treat them. And I think the same can be said about life and the hardships we go through. We need to acknowledge the truth uh, so that we can move forward. Now, the counterpart to truth, lies. There are many different types of lies. Um, I see this every day in my practice from, you know, I always check my sugars, doc, to, you know, I've, uh, I've never missed out on my medications, you know, and lies, you know, they can be little, they can be large, they can be systemic. Um, but I think one of the worst lies that you know, we as people can commit is when, you know, we lie to ourselves, you know, uh, because if you lie to yourself enough, you, you eventually begin to believe it. Um, one of the things I, I sometimes hear when I'm dealing with these complex mental health issues would be something like, you know, I'm not good enough, I always fail. It becomes this almost self-fulfilling prophecy where, you know, they fail and then they encourage them to believe that and they fail to see often the good that they can do, the, the things that they have, the, the greatness they have into them. And, and to try to break that cycle and, and to get in there and help heal people is very difficult. It's, it's, a, it's a, like a negative feedback loop that can be hard to get in on. Now, I, I did have a very, you know, sad encounter with a patient once. Uh, it's more along the lines of, uh, they said to me, you know, when it was really hurt, was, you know, I'm ashamed that my, my parents taught me Mi'kmaq, that they, that they, 
you know, teach me these ways. I feel it's holding me back on my English proficiency. I, I feel it's holding me back on my endeavors. And it was very difficult to hear that because you could clearly see from speaking with the individual that they were very gifted, that they had a lot of talent, things that they could use. And, it was, and to speak with them and to uncover that took a great deal of time. But I feel it's a result of this, this system that we've, our people have been subjected to. For many years, you know, our people, we were taught and told that our ways of life were savage. We were devoid of meaning. We were, we were not human. We were subhuman. We were fed these systemic lies at a young age, for generation after generation, this intergenerational trauma that has built up and had long-lasting impact in all of our communities throughout Canada. And you may think, you know, I think as Tadas alluded to that, oh, that was, that was in the past. That doesn't happen today. Well, it does, unfortunately. Um, even today, I, I still hear racist rhetoric and, and misinformation. Um, I had a patient younger than me like tell me um, that they had learned in school that our immune systems, as, as Mi'kmaq, are worse than white folk. That that's why we all died of smallpox and that we die of diseases. This is just factually untrue. It's not true. Just to, as a doctor telling you that it's not true. Our immune system works just the same as any other human. We respond to vaccines, we build immunities, we come to contact with stuff and fight it off. Yes, there can be variation between peoples and different races and that and it can be affected by diseases like diabetes and everything. But overall, this is just true of all human characteristics, right? This is just one of these systemic lies that was perpetuated. Now, and if you don't believe me, I mean, really, just look at history, look at any of the the European outbreaks of the Black Death or the plague, uh, completely the ravaged. Tons of different groups across Europe, um, and their immune systems were perfectly just fine. Uh, but I mean, this misinformation can run deep, in, even in today in society. And uh, I'm working my hardest, you know, mind to try to correct those when I see them. But it's it's difficult. It's going to take a lot of work and effort on behalf of everyone, right? Now. It's difficult to tell the truth. It is. We should all strive to tell the truth, even how hard it is, or at least try not to lie, because that feeds into the system. Um, and we can all, we're all guilty of this. We all do it. Um, but if you work it hard at being honest and, and you give your word, your word will have value. People will listen to you when you speak. They'll know this person speaks truthfully and they'll respect what you have to say. It's so one of the hardest, you know, one of the values I had to learn to, you know, to be a doctor. You know, you're not allowed to lie to patients. You need to be honest even when it's very difficult, right? When you have to tell somebody they're going to die or they have they've lost a loved one or anything. It's, while the truth can be often hard, it is the way forward. Now, to get a little bit more into things that, you know, I'd be lying to you if I didn't, if I didn't speak up to a lot of things that what Janos was saying, which is there is a lack of equitable access to healthcare for our peoples. Uh, we're all guilty of it in, in the healthcare system. Doctors, nurses, health authorities at every level has been guilty of this uh, discrimination and, and racism towards our folk. This disparity in healthcare for our indigenous people is just frankly appalling. Um, it, it's part of what drove me, you know, to, to want to become a doctor so that I could be a resource in the communities for people to be an access point to care. Uh, but you know, on my journey. You know, working in the system, I've seen and experienced a lot of hardships that our people face. Um, as a learner, I remember I was doing a, you know, a learning experience with a, a highly, when did we put this, I guess a, a doctor that was very high up at the hospital. And I was going out to one of our communities the next day. And uh, it was a bit of a drive. And he said, you know, watch your, be careful driving out there. And I said, Oh yeah, you know, it's a bit windy and you know, ice and that, I'll be careful. And he said, oh no, no, uh, worry about, you got to worry about all those other drivers. They're all drunks, every one of them. That's what he told me. Um, I, I don't know if he knew I was my background or, or what it was, but that was deeply hurting because this was also the person in charge of teaching me, in, in charge of making sure that, that, you know, that marked me at the end of the day for that rotation. And if that's what they're willing to say to me behind closed doors, what are they doing? in the open out there. Uh, I've personally seen a lot of the, the inequality with regards to the ER that Danas had seen too. Um, I, I am a colleague I mean, I, and I've seen that. 
I personally, in this last year, you know, my first year of practice, with Mescaline, I personally sent people to the ER by ambulance that I was worried about. And not for benign issues either, like, you know, issues I was significantly worried about. And I would be like, what, what happened? I'm not getting any follow-up. But, and then when I'd see them, they'd say they were accused of being drug users. Like, people that I, I know for a fact have never done any drugs outside of it, like very kind individuals, simply accused of being drug users and refused service because they're a native. I had one patient tell me they were told they were too fat and they needed to lose weight. Not treated seriously, refused from service. I was somebody that was really heartbreaking. They told me they were explicitly told by the doctor at the ER that they were wasting valuable healthcare resources that other people could be using. Someone that I sent there for healing, right? It, it makes me feel awful. It doesn't help us in any way. And it, it's hard to be. This, This, this fear of racism is so severe and rampant in many of our communities. You see it when we're practicing, as he alluded to. I'll be practically sometimes begging patients to go to the ER for, for heart attack, for stroke, for very bad infection, for broken bones, you name it. And, and I have patients outright refuse to go, will leave and go home because they fear racism that much at the, at the local hospital that they don't want to go in. Um, it makes it very difficult right because you know i i'm a i know I'm, I'm trained in work as a family doc and i try to stay in my scope of practice and help but you know i can't i can't fix a heart attack in my clinic right and, and i need them these resources to be equitable and accessible to my patients to help heal it i i often i once had a suicidal patient you know that was sent in and uh you know i wanted them to be seen assessed and they were sent home on melatonin and told they needed sleep, which is, frankly, it's, it's malpractice. It's not appropriate at all. This is somebody I was worried about and wanted to have a formal assessment done on. Now, I mean, on that mental health topic, we are seeing a significant rise in mental health crises. Um, now, this is all genders, all ages. My, my colleagues can vouch for me on this. You know, back when I was first doing my training, like, you know, you'd be in an office and your typical day were family medicine stuff, sore throats, diabetes, things like that. But now I would say at least a third of my day every day is devoted just to mental health. Um, and, you know, certainly COVID, you know, the post COVID atmosphere has contributed to this. Uh, you know, we're seeing this across the board in all communities, not just indigenous. But people, fail to realize the disproportionate amount of mental health issues that we face in our communities um, from the intergenerational trauma to the racism to, the, to everything else, all these barriers. Even prior to COVID, the stats were, were just atrocious. Um, for Indigenous children, you know, the rate of suicide is, is five to seven times higher than that of non-Indigenous, right? If you, if you look at it even further, you know, our, our Inuit populations of north, the youth, they're 11 times the national average. That's one of the highest in the world, right? That's here in Canada today, right? Uh, well, I've never personally worked up north in any of those communities. I've had colleagues that have, and the stories they tell me are very heartbreaking. People taking their lives in front of them, but it's, it's a very deep issue. And I know it may be triggering some stuff, so I do apologize for that. Now, in treatment of young people, you know, as I teach in med school, one of the leading causes of, you know, death in a young person, usually motor vehicle accident, drunk driving, something like that. But for First Nations here in Canada, suicide and self-inflicted injury are the leading cause of death under, age, under 44. Um, and that was prior to COVID, I'm sure since COVID and, and all the other stressors in recent history, including the residential schools news is, is there must be increase since then. You know, I've, I've only been working, you know, in my practice on my own for the last year, but you know, we've unfortunately seen some untimely deaths in, in our communities. And this is the real truth, this is today. Now, the majority of our communities are, are rural and remote, out of the way, far from primary care hospitals. This is 
throughout Canada for the most part. Um, sure, there's some here and there that are close to big city centers, but for almost the majority of our people, we are far removed. This makes access to healthcare system very difficult, just just from a just from being far from it. But when you start to include all the other significant issues that our people face, like increased rates of poverty, lack of housing, lack of vehicles, higher rates of lower education, uh, you see how these impact our access to care in an unfair manner. And then on top of that, the discrimination you face. It's, it's unbelievable. Now, some of our communities, you know, they exist in milk because that's where, you know, they always traditionally live, right? You know, my, my home of Bulladeck in Chapel Island, you know, small community, 500 folk. You know, it's a bit out of the way. And that's where we always lived. And, you know, that's where we traditionally where we, where we are. But some of our communities were purposely put in areas out of the way. These were concerted past government uh, relocation and demands that they did that they deemed, you know, better for our people. This often involved removing our people from fertile lands that they wanted uh, to then move them to less fertile swamp lands in some cases, simply because they wanted that land, right? You can imagine it's already difficult in life to, you know, to, to start a successful business, but when you're so far removed from major city centers, it's hard to make a successful business, right? It's hard to to provide for yourself, for your family, to 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 succeed. Right, and this is a snowballing effect that is unfairly impacts our people for no other reason than discrimination. Now, where I've been practicing medicine in Miskazoni, the it's, you know it's one of the largest populated communities we have in Nova Scotia. Um, this was a community in which government had to be located to people in the past, distant past. You know, people from my home community, Bolivar, were relocated to. Skazoni in the past. As a result, you know, I probably have more extended family in a community that, you know, I'm not even from originally, which is very odd. You can see like the systemic issues over time that have led to this, right? One of the major issues that many of our communities face is, is lack of housing, right? Um, and this is was exacerbated by these relocation initiatives, right? Putting a bunch of people in and they're not giving them the resources to care for themselves. Right. This is a significant public health issue. Clean drinking water. This is another large public health issue that is based our people. Um, access to clean uh, and safe drinking water is not equal for our people. We live in a country, look at this, with the largest fresh water supply in the world. That is us, Canada. Why is it so difficult to ensure that our communities have clean drinking water? This one, you know, it's always struck close to home for me. Um, you know, my home community, Bolivar, had a water crisis for many years. Um, this was largely ignored by the, you know, the local people in charge, and it was a it significantly impacted our people. Luckily, you know, my father, the councillor, the council. Uh, other people that were you know, very helpful in the area were able to secure you know, a new water treatment facility and a water tower. Um, but this was like, I mean, after many years and a great deal of effort and not all communities are as fortunate as their own. Right now, if you were to go on, you know, on the government website, you, you would see that there are still over 30 water advisories for indigenous communities across Canada. And these aren't new ones that just popped up. You know, these, some of these have been longstanding for many years and it continues to be an issue and it is unfair and unjust. Just last week, um, you know, yeah. our community that I work in there, we experienced a break in the main water line, you know, uh, no water to many of the houses and as well as our, you know, new health center. You know, this caused the close of our primary care health center for two days, right? Um, one of the only access points for people in the community for their health care was closed because we didn't have water, right? We couldn't run a clinic, we couldn't clean up properly, we couldn't do our procedures. And this is unfortunately not the first time this has happened. Uh, this sh shouldn't be an issue in, in, in 21, frankly. It's just, you know, it's tough. We, we do all the right stuff, you know, I work, I go through the system, I become a doctor, 
I go to provide health care and then something just like no water. It, it, I, I lose patience and see them for two days, right? It's horrible. And it just adds to the already substantial barriers to care that we see. All these issues, they, they certainly correlate with the national stats. The, the overall life expectancy for our indigenous people in Canada tends to be anywhere from five to 10 years shorter than the national average. And part of that is from, you know, the suicides of our young people I was talking about. Part of that comes from a higher infant mortality rate, you know, babies that die two to four times the national average for no good reason. Anyway, you know, I know we're talking about this can be triggering to some folks, so I, I do apologize in any way if I bring up that, you know, that harm. Um, you know, as we sort of alluded to already, um, you know, I would like to personally, you know, acknowledge the, the horrible news on the discovery of these mass graves of thousands of Indigenous children at these residential school sites across Canada. This is a, it's a very sensitive topic, you know. My sister is a social worker, works in our community, and she just refuses to watch news anymore. It's that triggering when she can't go in and do her job because of this, right? And it, the thing is, too, we were, I mean, growing up, I, I, I mean, it's with my colleagues and that, too, and the other people here, but, you know, I was always told stories of missing children, right? The elders would be like, people went away to these schools and didn't come back, and it was, it was denied. It was like they were making it up like they weren't believed. It's almost, it's such an atrocious thing. It's just difficult to comprehend, or, right? But, I mean, this, this event really shows that I think our oral history truly has valuable and should be taken seriously. It's a, it's a tough circumstance, and I only hope that we further uncover the truth of what has happened. Because, you know, in the end, every child matters. Now, back in 2016, uh, a Canadian human rights tribunal determined that the government of Canada's approach to the service of Indigenous children was discriminatory. I mean, this was, I mean, essentially the government reporting itself for being racist, which is, I'm glad they, they did that, but I mean, it goes without saying that, that our children are treated unfairly in the system. Um, now, sort of discuss a bit briefly there in Dadas's presentation. One of the tools I have as a physician, as a doctor, to, to help some of my, you know, my Indigenous kids is, is Jordan's principle. Now, we talked a little bit about it there, but I'd like to expand on it just a bit more, um, just including, again, any, any trigger warning, because it is a, it's a heartfelt story. But uh, many of you may have an idea what Jordan's principle is, but it's, I guess for me, it's, it's almost part of a, it's a part of the federal government, a policy that acts to try to provide equal health care for, for our children. Um, so, for example, if I had a, a child I was worried about that had autism or I thought might have autism, that, you know, given we're so rural and remote and they can't afford maybe a private, you know, way to diagnose that, I can, you know, write to George the principal. They can sometimes then cover, you know, travel to the appointment, getting them there having that done and facilitated is very helpful for me, you know, as a tool to help, you know, treat our people that, that don't have those resources. You know, unfortunately, this policy, it was born out of that very sad situation of Jordan River Anderson, a little Cree boy from Manitoba. You know, he had that permanent rare disability, as we discussed there, Kerry Feynman Zyder syndrome. It's like a form of muscular disorder. Um, and I mean, he spent his whole life in a hospital and he was, you know, granted permission to go home. The doctor thought, you know, this would be a good thing for him to go home, be able to see his family that, you know, may not have been able to go into the big city to see him with the elders, the community experience, you know, the love that his family had for him and that his community had for him. But the politics, right? You know, traditionally, health care is, is covered by the provincial governments, right? They determine what who pays for what and where our healthcare dollars go. But because Jordan was native, right, indigenous, Cree, um, this caused a loophole where, you know, the federal government covers some things for indigenous people, such as drugs and, and serious things like that. And they essentially debated with each other 
who had to pay for this child's care? And they never got an answer. They, they kept debating and debating and refused to pay it until he, he never got to leave the hospital room. He never got to go home to see the people. He died at age five. If, if anyone wants to know further, if there's a lot more details to that. Uh, there's actually a documentary. It's called Jordan River Anderson, The Messenger. It's about 65 minutes long. It's, it's worth watching. You know, I do, you know, I have no way to confirm or deny this, but I, I, I often hear rumors, you know, working as a doctor, that the federal government is hoping to cut back or remove parts of Jordan's principle as they feel it is too costly. I guess it's not worth it to them. You know what? As a father of two children, it's difficult for me for them to ever imagine that they would suffer for no just reason, right? I mean, I mean, me myself, if I was born not even that long ago, right? My life would have been drastically different. I wouldn't have been treated as an equal. I would never have the opportunity to go to medical school or, or do any of that, simply because I was a big mom. Horrible. But for me, you know, I need I need to make the best of what I was given, right? I don't want to disappoint my ancestors that struggled through this hardship. You know, this is the first point in time where, you know, I have the opportunity to do these things. So I became a medical doctor so I can help healing, help healing our people and do it, right? And I, I don't want to disappoint. Now, the, the process of becoming a medical provider in general, it's not an easy one. It's, it's a hard, hard endeavor at baseline, right, for anyone. But when you add that our people, you know, they face all these struggles, lower levels of education, poverty, rural remoteness, right, it, it goes to show why we don't have very many big ma medical doctors and providers and nurses and nurse practitioners. I personally only know a handful, and like I'm talking one hand, and some of them don't even work, you know, within our province. This is a disproportionate amount to what we see in other populations. I often feel that the, the medical community, you know, the schools are often perhaps suffering from success in a way where the people that tend to go and become medical doctors tend to be the children of medical doctors. So you have doctors producing doctors that then almost concentrate even more year over year and typically in bigger city centers and then you lose doctors in the rural areas, even even communities outside our own. It's 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 very difficult, and then it's hard to then get in on that and, and enter it. It was certainly difficult for me. <sighs> now, with with that being said, uh, you know I'd like to acknowledge my own privilege, you know, of being able to do this and be a doctor. You know, I I shield myself and my family probably from any of the hardship my patients face. Right? I have I have this privilege. I have this opportunity. This power. That grants me level, and you know that's it's difficult. You know, it's, it come to terms with that. More important, I think it's good that that I acknowledge my own privilege too. Is you know I'm, I'm a cis hetero male, you know, sitting in this position of power, giving a lecture about you know equity, right? It, it's always the thing we need to we need to allow equal support and encouragement for individuals of any gender, any background, any sexual orientation. Uh, to succeed, we need to encourage them, give them the same level of opportunity as we would give anyone else. Now, to this day, there are still thousands of missing and murdered Indigenous women and children across Canada. Um, there's many people from our LGBT, uh, QT plus community, right, or two-spirit individuals. Um, I do feel back when, you know, the, the truth and reconciliation calls to action, this was probably one of the more prominent issues that was around at the time, but I feel in recent history, in light of world events and in light of racism, it's lost the coverage that it diseased. It's, it's critically overlooked, right? There's still thousands of these women that we still don't know where they are or who killed them. Um, I feel this day of truth and reconciliation, you know, it should be used as a day to rekindle our efforts and discovering the truth for those women, right? It's not uncommon for our women to, well, for their cases to just be ruled closed or, or simply forgotten about and with often little or no investigation by the by communities outside our own, right? 
our women, you know, they make up only 3% of females nationally, but they represent over 10% of homicides of females in Canada. This is a disproportionate amount and it's unfair and unjust. I remember we introduced the, uh, the, the, the broadcast system. Uh, I remember being really scared by it the first time it went off, but I thought this is a good idea. You know, if some if a child or a woman or someone goes missing, um, we'll be able to quickly alert the general public and find them. However, you know, for personal experience, we had a, a young female missing in our community for several days, and I thought, ah, we haven't, they didn't put it on the alert system. Eventually it was, and we were luckily in this case, we were able to found the girl and that everything was good. Um, but I thought, why did it take so many days for that to happen when I know for a fact these other women that have been ringing on my phone were declared missing immediately? Um, when you look into this further, it's actually a, sort of a pretty well known statistical phenomenon called missing white woman syndrome. Now, anybody, any child, any person missing of any race or background is a travesty, but all people who are missing are entitled to the same love and effort to find them, right? They should be. It's not uncommon that, you know, a missing white woman would be, would be gone and they'll get weeks of media coverage at a time, like devoted. It's, it's almost, it's, it's just crazy sometimes why this happens and they're just obsessed with it. But then our women can be missing and we'll be lucky to even get a mention on a local, you know, news station that they're gone. That's what they're looking for and that they're missing and that their families missing want to see them. I, I sincerely hope that further effort, you know, we can find answers, you know, for the sake of the people, for the community, for the friends and the family. Now, I would like to take, you know, a little bit of a time to address a, a topic that was touched on it also in the earlier presentation. And that's the ongoing uh, dispute between uh, the commercial fisheries and the indigenous fisheries. It's probably one of the, I think, the biggest, you know, uh, indigenous thing that we're seeing in the media, especially in Nova Scotia and the Maritimes. Um, and it's a very, it's a very high energy, very angry situation that, you know, I debated on even how much I wanted to talk about it today, right? Because it's scary, right? But I do feel it is my responsibility as a leader in one of our communities to discuss it and at least give my voice and what I see in my opinion. Um, now, to be frank, I am not a fisherman. I have no background in fishing. I'm ignorant to the process. I don't know how to tie a fishing knot. I can't, can't cast my dad trying to get me into it. And I, I was reading books <laughs> with no interest. Um, now, I will disclose, you know, my father's chief. He's very deeply invested in this ongoing dispute. Um, we are all hoping for a peaceful resolution to the situation, um, but I can only comment on what I see personally. And I, I see many indigenous fishers at my clinic, and it's you know ties into this mental health is issues too. It just horrific some of the stuff they have to put up with, like having flares shot at them, having their boats rammed, having people sneak onto their boats out in the middle of the sea in the middle of the night to destroy their equipment while they're out there. Like it's it's horrifying. Um, there's been threats sent into public office that, you know, if the government doesn't shut these people down, we'll take it into our own hands. It's, it's scary. It, it, people don't feel safe or welcome. Yeah, I, I do feel for fishers, commercial and otherwise in general, right? Um, but, you know, our people only want to practice their, their moderate livelihood um, as per the treaty rights, as per the, the 1999 Supreme Court decision with, with you know, Donald Marshall Jr. and other, you know, McMahon Marshall. Um, see that decision yourself for further for further details on that but you know it, it this has been left to, to fester and boil and become aggressive right it's scary now fishing itself you know commercial fishermen include this is a very probably one of the last really true honorable professions that's that's where we're like if the world suddenly collapsed say and i had to provide like, i'm going to be in trouble i don't know how to hunt i don't know how to fish um, I'm really good at suturing and caring for people, you know, that way. But if I don't have the equipment, I'm going to be in trouble. You know, the fishers, you know, they're going to be, whether they have gasoline or not, they're going to be paddling out in the water, fishing up those fish, providing for themselves, providing for the family. This is often a trade that's been you know, passed down from generation to generation. 
you know, brother, mother and father, son and daughter, everyone, right? It's it's very good. And I often feel people fail to see the similarities we have with one another, these same things we see on either side, right? Um, when I try to look at, I try to look into it further and to see what, what concerns is, you know, what concerns with the commercial fishery side of raising. One of the ones that I think might have stood up for me maybe was concern for conservation, you know, fishing, thin season, certain catch requirements. Now, I'm not an expert, but I, I can assure you that our indigenous people of Canada have a great and renowned respect for invested interest in sustainability. You know, our people have been fishing, hunting these lands sustainably for many years, long before any settlers came, and our people just want to continue their way of life, practice their moderate livelihood, be who they are. Um, you know, you know, speaking with my dad and all the bands that are involved, they're all working towards sustainability, making sure that their fisheries, because they care about it, the people care about it. We can speak with the public. I do sometimes feel perhaps the conservation element is is used by some a select few folk to, to advance, I mean, really racist and rhetoric, racist attacks and rhetoric. Like it's not it's not helpful to them, it's not helpful to their cause, it's not helpful to us, it's very scary. And I think this has to be not tolerated whatsoever in, in St. Helena, and the truth be told. If conservation is really, you know, an issue, then you need to be accurate with the numbers, right? Migma, I tried to find an accurate number, but, you know, First Nation fisheries in Nova Scotia make up anywhere from, I saw, less than 1% to a high of 6% of, of total market at, at all at any time. When you consider that, you know, Canada fishes the Atlantic, the Arctic, the Pacific, and then Canada is also only a smaller player against the USA, China, Scandinavian countries. It's it's just dishonest and untruthful to try to blame conservation on or lack of conservation on indigenous fisheries. It's just not possible. It's not true. Um, and you know, I, I do feel you know I want a peaceful resolution to this conflict. Um, if conservation is truly a concern, then we need to have a frank and honest discussion about stricter quotas for for everyone involved, right? Now, I do feel the federal government just failed tremendously on this situation. I mean. They sat on their their status of moderate livelihood for over 20 years now. Uh, they didn't do any service to our people in clarifying things or to the commercial fishers. Um, and this is a largely preventable quarrel when we're letting them do it up for no reason. There needs to be intervention. There needs to be, you know, truth about what's going on here and what we're seeing. Now, again, I'm, I'm not a fisherman, I'm a doctor, and I'm just offering my opinion and what I'm seeing you know, in the population and what people are telling me and treating my, my patient and trying to heal. I am open to learning more. And if anybody wants to educate me further on it, please, please do. You know, I, I'm always interested in learning. With that being said, you know, I would, you know, I'd like to switch gears and talk about healing and, and some of the positives that I see, right? Um, in my journey, you know, to becoming happy, it was very difficult, you know, as, as I discussed with you, but, you know, I want to be able to replicate that story because I want, you know, me and, you know, to we got our foot in the door, right? We want other, you know, people from our community just to come in and fill that gap for care, to, to help, to, to promote that healing from within. Uh, I hear this a lot from the communities that, you know, we need our people in positions of power to, to, to read the healing, right? I hear this Outside of our communities, like other Cape Bretoners, you know, they tell me, um, you know, I want a doctor from here. <laughs> you know, and it makes sense. You know, you got somebody from your community. You know, they have a vested interest in your community. They want to give back, you know. Um, but I would like, to, this is where I may disagree with some folk, you know, a little bit, but I would like to challenge the concept. I, I do feel that true meaningful change has to come from within. But it also has to come from the outside as a team, not as one directing or coaching the other, but as a together as a whole unit. That's how we move forward. Um, I would not be in the position I am today without some influential people that were, were there to help me. And some of these people, you know, were not from our community, they didn't share my background, they didn't have an obligation, but they did. They reached out and they helped me. And I think it's important to point out when this happens to not only acknowledge it, but so that we can encourage it to happen again, right? You know, where I work in Escazoni, you know, I, I work with some great colleagues, uh, to not work with them too, well, Dr. Ta, Dr. Brody, 
Dr. Crosby before me, these are you know, white doctors that devoted their lives to helping our people, right? And with them there as support and colleagues, you know, I'm able to do that now too. Uh, and I give them great thanks. Even, even doctors before them, Dr. Varick, a, a doctor from not even our country, you know, divided, divided his, you know, he came in here, saw the need and helped. And there's lots of social workers that go in, here, nurses, pharmacists from all backgrounds, you know, that help. And they help to build, build the base to which, you know, I set my own success. So I, I do feel we need to strive for, for help on both fronts, not just, not just from within, but from outside as well. No, this isn't without difficulty, you know. Um, it's hard. It's hard to erase and, and, and fix and, and to, to eliminate this injustice that's occurring, right? It's been built in and systemic for many, many years. Um, but I think it can be done. And I think there's people that are good, that are out there, that want it to be done. Uh, we need to recognize the hard work of everyone involved in, in order to move forward and, and recognize the truth. And often, a quote I hear is, it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, I think it takes a whole country to reach true uh, truth and reconciliation. And uh, you know, I'd like to end on a, you know, a positive note and, and I look forward to the future. I think there's a lot of work to be done, but I think we can do it and I really want to move forward with, with the positives. Yeah, thank you for having me speak. Uh, I'll pass it back there to our <laughs> presenter. Thank you so much, Dr. Marshall. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, tonight to speak with us and to share your lived experience on the truth in healthcare as well. Um, so Tanas, if uh, you're still here as well, uh, we're gonna open it up uh, for some questions and answers to either of our speakers uh, from tonight. Uh, so if you could just use the raise your hand feature on uh, Teams, uh, once I call on you, you can turn on your camera and unmute your mic, uh, and we'll have just about 20 minutes uh, for questions. Um, I think I see one hand already. Clara? Hi. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. You can go ahead with your question. Um, this is kind of a general question for both of you. Um, I'm a third year nursing student at UMB St. John in New Brunswick, and um, this event was brought to my attention by my clinical instructor. We're working and learning a lot about community outreach, uh, working with vulnerable populations and identifying the need and barriers of people who need our support more than anything. Um, there's actually a few students from my class who are on this call right now because we, you know, we, we wanna be an ally. We wanna be able to learn more and, you know, just be a voice of support for people who need us because we're we, like, as a, a white, heterosexual female like I am a person of privilege and I need to use that that power and support that I have from my family and my friends to uplift others so I just want to know what kind of resources are available to me to learn more about indigenous healing and indigenous medicine because I, I want to be an emergency like an ER nurse when I graduate so I want to be there right on the front lines being able to care for people so I just I want to learn more about how to incorporate um cultural traditions and practices into my practice. I'm going to let Tanas take this one because I feel he has some valuable tools you can point to for us. Yeah, um, I often tell people just like realizing what land you're occupying. Uh, there is this neat website called nativelands.org, I believe, on if you can Google it. Um, but it shows a map and it tells you the lands you're occupying, the la languages spoken on the lands that you're occupying, the treaties that apply to the lands that you're occupying, and the people that are on the lands you're occupying. Um, and I think that's kind of, a because regardless, like, you, you, like even if you're in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and you decide to pick up and go to Ontario or BC, it, it's good to know, like, who you may potentially come into contact with and care. And I really do feel that uh, informing your practice around trauma-informed care and just really realizing that the history that that's around us and, and that we immerse ourselves in, um, just because at the end of the day, at least that awareness that you're, you're able to kind of uh, approach care in the back of your head that I'm not going to cause this 
this uh, uh, negative uh, experience for this in individual just because like in frontline areas, whether or not emergency care, uh, crisis care, like realize as healthcare providers, um, you, if you cause one negative experience, you're, you're going to close that door for good for uh, Indigenous patients, Black patients, other racialized communities, to SLGBTQ, and that opportunity for preventative health or secondary care, uh, or like I said, catching things that might have been caught, you're closing that door for good. And potentially you're closing that door for their family, their friends and their community. So I think we all have a role to kind of try and uh, ground ourselves in in what trauma may, may I uh, encounter or potentially this person may not have experienced trauma, but just having it in the back of our head that this is what this person could have experienced and and realize how it took for that individual to get there. As I mentioned, like sometimes we exhaust all options before we present to the emergency department and that one opportunity to catch something or to treat something is gone for good. Uh, so I, I think like even asking these questions and being OK with asking these questions, I think there should be an uncomfortability with it, too, because like it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about. And once we kind of get through the uncomfortableness with it, we're going to make time for meaningful change to kind of inform our practice, decrease barriers within our healthcare care system. Um, and I always challenge people to walk around their your practice and try to identify what barriers are present. Like I always say, like language is a huge barrier. So incorporating Mi'kmaq language into your waiting room, in, in, incorporating French language or like or Cantonese, like into your 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 care areas, just so you can be inclusive. You can be you're not leaving anyone out. Yeah, and uh, there's a lot of so, like for Mi'kmaq patients specifically, I always link to the Mi'kmaq Gnawmanwe app. Um, there is uh, an app that you can learn Mi'kmaq, uh, and and it's really applicable for caring for uh, Mi'kmaq patients and children. Uh, it's Onnui uh, Zudimk. It's an application. It's on iPhone and Android, and I like every day. Every day. There's a word I need to brush up on and people who I come in contact with. Yeah, Carl has it on his phone. Uh, so I'm, I very, I'm very proud of this app. My brother-in-law, Alo Injidor, helped develop it. He voices a lot of them. He's very, very known. He's very good at his big boss speaking. And it's excellent. So it, it's even simple stuff. I'm like, what is the word for broth? OK. Buscone. Buscone? Buscone? Yeah. Yeah, so stuff like that. And I, I think to like speaking to that, um, learning the language, uh, I've had the, the, the privilege and opportunity to work with amazing people in my career. And one, one that strikes me often, and she, she's in, in the crowd too, and, and another physician that I've worked with, that often try and speak Mi'kmaq in the emergency department, whether or not say in Gwe or Madawa Lane, it, it just, that word of saying hello in our language removes such a power imbalance that's present in the room. It removes such uncomfortability that's present in the room just by acknowledging that like it took you a lot to come here. Let me introduce myself in your language to make you a little bit more comfortable is just practice changing. It, it just removes a barrier that you didn't even think of. Um, and and I, I, I often share this story because it's something that you know what like if you can learn just one word in Mi'kmaq, it's gwe, and that's hello. And 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 if like like I said, that that's one story I love sharing, and and it's something that like it's going to make us make a difference in this healthcare system. No, it's great. And if I could just add too, it's a lot of what he said, but you know, common sense stuff. Like if I was going to go overseas to some foreign country or something, like in Africa, if I don't educate myself about what's going on locally, what's going on, try to understand some semblance of the language. I'm asking for trouble for myself and others, right? Um, so it's just having that awareness to go in and, and do that and, and do the same thing for, for anyone else, right? I, I do Thank wanna... you so much. Yeah, I do want to... awesome. Highlight... I really appreciate it. No problem. And thank you for the amazing question. Um, like for an example, like in our emergency departments across the province, we have these iPads that are present in the EDs 
and it has a lot of languages for interpretive services. It does not include Mi'kmaq. And it's really important to have that opportunity to, to bring translators into our hospitals when available. As you know, there's some people that may not necessarily speak English or may not understand certain concepts in English, especially when Mi'kmaq being the first language. The IWK, there's amazing resources such as navigated, uh, navigated coordinators and um, translation services can kind of coordinate some sort of translation services if needed. Um, so I just think like just looking around what's available to you and, and just inquire like what's here and what's not here. And then when you realize when something's not here, advocate for it. Like this is why we need it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate I've learned so much. I'm going to be here the next two nights too. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Clara, for your question. Thank you for listening in. Do we have any other questions uh, from our participants here tonight? Uh, Dr. Anderson? Uh, thanks, Hannah. And I, I really do want to thank Tanas and, and, and Dr. Marshall for, you know, sharing the truth with us tonight. I, I you know, again, as a white man of privilege, it, it is hard to hear the truth. And um, I, I, you know, I, I do share Carl's optimism for the future. I do, I do think um, there are, there are better times ahead. And I, and I think the truth is we, we need to do better. We, we need to do better in supporting Indigenous people. We definitely need to do better with, um, with, with the health and the healthcare system. Uh, uh, and, and I think you, you have our commitment to, to, to work with you on, on these very, very important issues. So I, I too am looking forward to the next two nights and uh, of, of, of reconciliation and, and the path forward, but I, I think you've you've done a wonderful job at setting the stage with your presentations on the truth. So thank you, thank you very much uh, from thank, the bottom. Thank you for, for listening to us. I um, I mean, th I mean the simple fact that you have you know a Mi'kmaq doctor and nurse practitioner speaking at a Dell event. This would have been, I mean, unheard of not that long ago, right? Um, so I, I think the changes that we're seeing, I think, are good and for the better. And it's going to be time, but. I do share that optimism, and I, and I thank you for, for also sharing that too. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Anderson, and I look forward to as we move the work forward um, at Dal. Um, Dr. Link, did you have a question? Yes, thanks, Hannah, and uh, and Tanis and Carl. Thank you again. This was a, a very insightful, and you both presented beautifully. And uh, I wish all of my department were here tonight uh, to hear this. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, one of the great things that uh, I, I think that Dal is trying to do through the Global Health Office with Hannah's leadership and others is to increase the number of young people who might be interested in the health professions uh, with summer camps or March break camps and, and other ways. And I'm just wondering, um, Carl and Tanis, do you folks have any uh, other suggestions about how we can get you know, elementary school kids and junior high school kids and high school kids excited or at least thinking about this. You two are obviously fine examples of it, but you can't be everywhere all at once. Or there are other things that we could be sharing and helping to 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 make uh, even more young people choose the health professions. You first. Oh, okay. Um. I really think visibility is a big thing, and I, and I do realize that's part of the recruitment and ret retention services, but um, it's a whole different story when we're able to actually see ourselves in the profession itself. Um, I know, like, my upbringing, like, I didn't really have anyone in medicine, um, family-wise, uh, other than, like, my great-aunt, uh, who was a, a nurse in World War II, um, but other than that, like I didn't really have anyone to look up to or to go to for the guidance. Um, so when I actually made the decision to go into nursing, I realized that there were so many closed doors. Um, so I 
try to make it a point to try to open these doors so and to continue to keep them open um, because the profound thing is not being the first. It's, it's the fact that there will be a second, a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and so forth. Um, so I think the big part is visibility. And, and I know for, for an example, like when I used to work in youth health, just being in, present in schools and just having people uh, in roles such as nursing or, or physio or, or as physicians, um, just like I said, seeing yourself in a role that one day you can be like, oh my God, like Danas did that, I can do that too. Just cause like when you're grown up and as you're growing and raised, um, there's almost this layer of external oppression that you, you're, you're kind of expected to fall in this stereotype. And unfortunately, youth do kind of follow this, this road of self-doubt as Carl has mentioned in, in his presentation. And, and I don't think that's something that we should go through because like in post-secondary education, like yes, like we're going through assignments and, and we're going through exams, but realize that we're navigating through racism, both individual and systemic. We're navigating through language barriers. We're navigating through um, uh, Western pedagogies and ways of knowing and trying to adopt them and adapt way our, our, ourselves in order to succeed when actually it's the system itself that should bend and adapt to meet our needs, not the other way around. And I really do feel that trying to position education and health systems from the early age to, to, to model and mold people for success, I think will be very impactful. So whether or not, like I said, like I, I tried to do, I tried to do presentations in schools, like whether or not it's about health and not there as an NP, but there as an individual to share, like, you know what, like this is, this is a field that, that you may, might love and you might be made for and, and, and just starting at spark, Hopefully, it will turn into a fire and continuously have children become trailblazers for uh, many generations. Thanks so much, Janas. Yeah. Um, I Can think I we have one of. Or, or no, do you have, no, get to the other question. That's fine. Okay, thanks. Um, Sydney Forbes, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, so I am an AT woman, very lucky to be exceedingly white passing, um, <laughs> but I'm also a med one student. And so my question kind of revolves around like between like self advocacy and advocacy for the people because of the fact that I'm white passing. A lot of individuals feel comfortable sharing their racist insights or having those remarks around me. How do you navigate the power struggle of being you know, the lowly med student on hand and having these comments come from a position of power. Congratulations, you're, you're a medical student. That's an accomplishment of itself. You are the, the cream of the cream of the crop. You're very talented and I'm very proud that you're, you're in medical school. That's an achievement in itself. So always remember that, okay? Um, medical school is tough. It is a grind in many different ways. Um, it's it's a very difficult thing. I, there's situations when I work, look back and I'm thinking, there's such a power differential, right? These people are teaching us, but also, you know, they're grading us. They have these, having had a peak nail on the other side of the curtain as a medical provider at the end of it, um, I wish in hindsight I'd have stood up for myself, stood up for our people more, right? Um, and really, you know, put the system to the test, make sure they're on our side for this, right? Um, so, you know, if you get those hateful, hurtful comments from, from you to call it out for what it is, right? Um, be willing, you know, proud enough, you know, to stand up for yourself and, and do that. It's hard to do. It's very difficult, right? It, it takes a hard, it's, it's not an easy thing to come by, right? Um, but you, you know, you're an exceptional individual. You're in medical school. I, I know you can do this and, you know, you have the power to do so. It's more the confidence and what you do now, you know, paves the way for the future too. Um, I guess to add to that, and like Carl was saying, congratulations. Um, 
you're constantly navigating through microaggressions too. And the, not only on top of microaggressions, you also experience lateral violence in med school too from uh, other higher up professionals. Um, but I, I think being able to ground yourself to say like, you know, at the end of the day, I know where I want to be. I know where how I want to succeed. Um, you, you're going to come in contact with people that will get you and understand you, not to a point to under, try to understand where you're coming from, but to a point they realize, you know what, like there's there's going to be a, like a bond, not only that, to realize, you know what, people need each other. Like you, can, you can't expect to navigate through medical school alone. Like it's something that we as people, we have this, in, in, in this inherent need to, to, to bond, to help each other. And, and I always like saying that word, it's a bon model dinage, like you, you're working together. Um, unfortunately, there are going to be people who are going to make comments like I've, I can count on more than I, I, I would have handfuls of myself if I can count how many microaggressive comments that I tolerate. And that's the thing that we continue to tolerate them. And I, and I feel that we should be, be put in positions that we have, feel supported to call them out. Um, and, and I really do feel like that that's medi like medicine's responsibility to provide that that environment to be able to call out um, microaggressions or inherent racism. Um, and, and if there are comments, like you can kind of just say like, you know what, realize what you're saying can like, might not affect me, but at the same time it is. Realize if you might, if you say it to the right or wrong person, like realize that there could be repercussions associated. Um, but really, like I said, I really do feel that we have to move away from tolerance and, and really be able to kind of move towards being able to advocate for ourselves and advocate for others. Like people, all, other people do have that responsibility to call it out too, not just yourself. Wonderful. Thank you both. Thank you, Sydney, for your question. Um, in closing now, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Catherine Martin if she could uh, come back online and just uh, lead us through a closing prayer to end the event. I know we're just a little bit over time, uh, but if you have a few minutes to stick around just for the closing. Um, Kathy, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Just a second. No. Well, <clears throat> I can't say all the things I was going to say because we don't have much time. But I wanted to um, say that the late, ch late Chief Newell Doucette was a great leader because he spoke the truth. And it was hard to hear in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. It was hard for people to hear and most people wouldn't listen. And so I just think of him and I think of how proud he is right now watching Carl and Denas. And I knew him very well and he, he spoke at the Liscombe Lodge. It was the very first conference um, close to where Hannah's home is. Very first conference ever on social and economic change for the Mi'kmaq. And he spoke about the people that he has to bury all the time and how he wanted that to change. And he spoke, ex he said the same things that you, Danas and Carl were saying, I, I remember how much he would say. And it's amazing that you're saying it and now you're in the positions of power. And that was his dream. And I wanted to remind everybody about him and all of those who have gone before us, who have done so much for thousands of years to, to make sure that we lived our life the way we knew and, not, and know today. And to speak the language, I must say that um, Danas's 
working in Millbrook and my mom is 87 and what joy Danas brought to her when he visited her home or she visited your office, I'm not sure, but that she could speak Mi'kmaq to me and to our family. It's, it's just everything we've ever wanted is for mom to, you know, to explain the way she needs to talk is in her language. Um, so um, I'm here for all of you. I, I, um, I'm one of those, um, you know, warriors that have been fighting for this day, the day uh, today with Hannah, Danas, Carl, our last uh, person who spoke. And um, if you said anything that you said, you have to speak up now. And that you shouldn't expect the Mi'kmaq and the indigenous people to do that work. It's not our work. Our work is to continue to do what Carl and Dinas and Hannah are doing. And, and the work of those around us are to call out those people that are speaking and be honest and be brave. <clears throat> in the dark. Everybody and all of you who came that uh, that's how we move forward just listening and speaking but one is as important as the other well Ali ok well, Catherine uh, and and Tanas and Dr. Marshall for being here this evening and we look forward to everyone joining us uh, the next two evenings to continue our learning and working together to work towards reconciliation. Have a great night everyone. Woo